My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian, I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So... Every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know, and then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the classical classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the classical classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and I am stoked to welcome back to the show Rachel Barton Pine, who's joining us all the way from New York City. Rachel is what is commonly referred to in the trade as a badass. She is a Chicago-based violinist who started soloing with orchestras at the tender age of seven. She's won too many classical music awards to enumerate here. In addition to playing with orchestras, she plays with the metal band Earth and Grave. Rachel also heads up the Rachel Elizabeth Barton Foundation, which gives classical musicians, young classical musicians, a helping hand, and Global Heartstrings, which provides classical music instruments to developing countries. In her copious free time, she tours, and she just today, January 13th, released a brand new CD. Rachel, welcome back to Classical Classroom. Great to be back. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's good to hear your voice. So what are you going to be teaching me about today? Well, my new album is Mozart's Violin Concertos. Mozart wrote five of them, and he wrote them all in his late teens. But of course, you got to realize he was writing symphonies at the age of five. So him oh being God. a teenager was a little different than the rest of us being teenagers. But in one way, he was still a teenager. His dad kept trying to nag him to practice his violin, and he kind of rebelled by not practicing his violin. <laughs> and there was like a whole struggle thing going on there. And ultimately, he ended up gravitating more towards the piano and disappointing his father. But he clearly loved bowed stringed instruments nonetheless. He ended up playing the alto-voiced cousin of the violin, you know, the, the member of the string family called the viola. Uh-huh. And that ended up being the string instrument that he usually chose thereafter. Um, so he was still, you know, so I think if his father hadn't been nagging him to practice the violin, he actually might have left us with even more violin concertos. But thank goodness he gave us these five I had been talking to somebody else about about this and was just amazed that he wrote these when he was a, a teenager. And and he wrote five. Why only five? And and like what's what's the difference kind of between the five? Yeah, well, that's actually a great question. Um, of course, they're all in different keys, but they each have different essential characters. Number three is actually my favorite because it's in G major and it's just so friendly feels like if each of these concertos was a person and who were you going to hang out with for me it would definitely be number three Um, puts a smile on my face every time somehow Um, what's interesting about three four and five is that in the last movements of those concertos He diverges from the rondo form. A rondo form is where you have a theme, and then you have another section, and you go back to that same theme, and then another section, and the theme. So the theme keeps coming back in between each, you know, sort of other section. But in 3, 4, and 5, in those last rondo movements, Mozart takes a left turn and goes into this whole different section before picking up where he left off with the rondo. In the case of number 3, the section that he goes off into sounds like the kind of tune you would sing in a pub. (laughs) It's just this, like, jolly, folksy kind of a tune. And he even does these silly things like plucking the strings a bit uh, that make it, give it almost like a fiddle flavor. And so that's really fun. Number five is considered to be the greatest of the violin concertos, and for good reason. It's definitely the one that I admire the most, even if it's not my favorite on a personal level. Um, But it's a great, great concerto, and he actually is much more adventurous with sort of how he puts it together, but also even more dramatic with the musical material. I've always felt that Mozart's operas really shone a light on um, what he's doing with his concertos. Just the sense of drama. You can almost hear 
the dialogue between different voices having a flirtation scene and mm -hmm. then the little romantic aria is interrupted by these little brilliant moments that come in unexpectedly. There's even a part where you feel like it's a plot and like, you know, the guy and the girl have finally gotten together and then she sees him with this other woman and so she's like super upset and then it turns <laughs> out that it was just his best friend dressed up like a woman for whatever, you know, one of those misunderstandings <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, life is good after all and, you know, so you could just yeah. see all of this unfolding in your mind as as the concerto is going along and to try to try to tell that story without words and convey that plot to the audience is always the um, really fun challenge of performing these pieces. Well, I noticed that you kind of didn't talk a whole lot about one and two. And I was talking to uh, another young violinist today who was saying that it's kind of weird that one and two don't really get played that much, but you've included all five on your CD, and, and I was reading kind of about your shows, and you'll and you'll play the entire, like all five, when you, in an in a evening's performance. Yeah, it's like a marathon, but it's such a great immersion for both the audience and the performers to do all five in a single evening, and I've been touring that around for the last few years, which is what led to um, wanting to record them. But yeah, one and two um, don't have that sort of radical, um, adventurous idea of the you know, the sort of contrasting section in the last movement. Uh, but they're still great, great concertos. It's funny, if he had never written three, four, and five, and he had left us with just one and two, I think mm -hmm. we would have held them up as some of the greatest concertos of the era. But because he surpassed himself with uh, even better music, then okay. we tend to give those concertos, which are perfectly wonderful, short shrift because they're because they're ones that are more wonderful yet if you know what I mean right um, okay but they're really great and actually um, have you know things to offer that the other three don't in terms of their personalities and you know like I said I try to make each one really sound individual and not like you know well here's another Mozart but no <laughs> here's this one and here's this one and try to um, number one is probably the most virtuosic, even though number five is the most challenging. Mm -hmm. there, the last movement of number one is very fast and very brilliant, and it's like a, a, a great romp. Uh, whereas the others are, are much more elegant um, mm -hmm. and... You know, the slow movements are of both of those concertos they just tug at your heartstrings. And um, the first movement of the D major in um, number two is very interesting when you compare it with the first movement of the D major number four. They're the only two that share a key. And mm -hmm. D major is, of course, the key of trumpets. And number four begins with a fanfare. Um, number two has a little bit of a fanfare, but only just for a moment. It's a little more subdued, but it actually ends with an exclamation point at the end of the whole concerto, whereas number four ends very gently, like after all that excitement, let's just say goodnight. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> he's doing two very different things, even with the same key. Just shows you what a genius he was. Well, so, okay, so that's that kind of brings me to my next question, which is that I know that these are pieces that kind of every young violinist learns to play. So so why these? Like, what what makes these special to you? Like, why did you feel called to record them? Well, I've been playing the music of Mozart and listening to the music of Mozart almost from the beginning, you know, from my very earliest days as a young violinist in the single digits. I first soloed a concerto by Mozart with an orchestra, a professional orchestra, when I was 10 years old, which was actually the number four in D major. And, mm -hmm. you know, just loving listening to works like the Mozart Requiem and Mozart's operas and Mozart's chamber music, Mozart's symphonic music. I mean, there's so much great stuff. And, you know, so, but it was really, like I said, touring the, the whole cycle that made me want to record those pieces now. Um, hmm. It's funny, because if I had to list my favorite composer, it would be Bach, with Brahms as a close second. And yet, there's something special about Mozart's music. Um, actually, of all the composers that exist, um, Mozart is the only one that brings tears to my eyes the most often. Huh. Um, not And not his minor key melodies. Not It's not like the sadness of something or another. It's actually some of his slow major key beautiful melodies that are just so gorgeous that they're heartbreaking. It's hard to even put it into words, but it's like the beauty is so profound 
that it just brings tears to your eyes, like you're, like you're touching, um, you know, something otherworldly, and that he was mm. keyed into into that, and it, it's very spiritual actually. And you you see this in the in the Mozart movie when there's uh, when Salieri is experiencing, you know, this this piece that Mozart wrote with winds, this this serenade, and he's singing it in his head, and he's just blown away by how gorgeous it is and then he goes and sees this this young guy who's like this crude you know sort of comical character and and that's Mozart and that's what you get you get these these moments of absolute you know profound you know music that's that's touching God and then all of a sudden he's making a joke (laughs) and actually to try to capture that and make that coherent is what makes this music so brilliant that it's the divine and the human hand in hand well, uh, okay, and speaking of being human, so you're on tour, uh, you know, you've recorded the CD, and you're on tour, uh, say, playing these pieces night after night, and, and you, like you said, you've been playing them since you were a wee Rachel. Like, how how do you keep from getting bored playing these pieces over and over again? Like, what, what kind of, like, keeps you connected? Well, I can't imagine that I ever would, but actually one thing, one element that I bring to my performances is the fact that I do my own cadenzas, um, kind of like yeah. the guitar solo at the end of a rock song. You right. know, it's a chance for the individual performer to do their own fantasy on themes from the movement. And later composers often wrote their own cadenzas, you know, um, Tchaikovsky, Sibelius, even Mendelssohn. Um, but Brahms, Beethoven, Paganini, Mozart, they just left a... a an empty bar and just huh. you know told the performer to do their own thing is and that so, is that kind of a leftover from like the uh, the early music days like i know mozart was kind of like on the he, he kind of came on the tails of that and i know that the in in like uh, early music people kind of freestyled a lot that was sort of expected exactly so a lot of people improvised um extemporaneously the yeah. cadenzas and a few people even do that today, but those are usually pianists who specialize in music of the classical era. As a violinist, we're playing such a broad swath of repertoire and such a variety of different musical languages that we're not immersed enough in the classical period to feel safe completely improvising Mm -hmm. something like a cadenza on stage in front of an audience in in a performance. But um, nonetheless, I think writing your own um, gives you a chance to express how you feel about the music and to bring something really personal to the table. When I'm interpreting Mozart's music, we luckily have the manuscripts of these concertos in Mozart's own handwriting, and I have a reprint of those, which I um, am often referring to, to see his bowings and his articulations. And you can even get a sense of the phrasing just from seeing the stroke of the pen, which is an element that's been lost in these days of composers writing stuff on the computer, which is uh, visually more sterile. Mm -hmm. But... um, well, I try to be true to Mozart. I also try to bring my own personality because that's the only re- way that the music can totally come to life and be communicated is through me as the vehicle. So it's a mm-hmm. collaboration between me and and this long gone um, fellow musician Mozart. And the cadenzas are a chance for me to do something that reflects my ideas about the piece and just kind of go off and just just jam on the the music that he wrote, but in my own way. That's and really so, cool. Um, I have been playing the same cadenzas um, since I wrote them, um, mostly in my teens. Um, actually, I never even thought about that. He wrote the concertos in his teens. I wrote my cadenzas in my teens. Maybe there's wow. some kind of symmetry there. But the way that I play my cadenzas is constantly evolving as I grow and change as a musician. So that's always really fun to sort of have a bit of me and a bit of Mozart yeah. and you know share with the audience something fresh that maybe they haven't heard before. You like earlier too. You're you're talking about how you kind of hear these characters in in the music. Do you tell yourself 
stories? Like, do you see stories in the music that you think about when you're playing? Yeah, well, I mean, music goes beyond language, but definitely, you know, and especially when I'm coaching these to young violinists in master classes, I always try to get them to use the adjectives to define what's the character of this phrase and that phrase and this section and that section, because, you know, Mozart can end up being polite and pretty, and I don't think that that's what he wanted his music to be. Uh-huh. It's not just supposed to be nice. It's supposed to have, you know, all the the drama and all the intensity of later music within the language of the late 1700s. Mm-hmm. And so trying to define that, you know, trying to define it in, you know, in the English language forces you to define it musically. And so it's an important exercise to engage in. And for a couple of the concertos, I almost have, you know, fully fledged out plot lines going on. And others, <laughs> it's just more about constantly changing scenes without necessarily a, a complete story. But um, yeah, just That's, whatever is going to inspire me to to make things as clear as possible for the listener. So the stories change over over time for you, like like you you hear different stories. Um, probably the details, but not the essence, which is the huh. same that I would say about my interpretations. Yeah. My idea of who Mozart is to me has been the same mm-hmm. since childhood, but how that manifests, you know, definitely I'm always striving to, um, you know, continue to to grow and mature as I become more and more experienced of an artist. It would be fascinating if you like wrote those down as like short stories. Oh, that would be totally embarrassing. No, it would be great. I would totally read that. Um, I understand that these pieces are a little bit different, and I don't know if this is true of all of Mozart's stuff, but but I know these pieces are a little bit different to play as a soloist with an orchestra. Can you can you talk about the difference between playing these pieces as opposed to I don't know like Tchaikovsky or something like that? Yeah, well they're, they're different on a couple of levels. Um, it's a great question. Um, first of all. You know, just in terms of the type of sound, you know, when you play Romantic era concertos, mid to late 1800s and then on into the 1900s, you have a robustness of sound. You're playing with a full symphony orchestra, what we call an orchestra. In the Mozart concertos, it just means strings, two oboes and two horns, and that's it. No other winds, no other brass, no percussion whatsoever. It's almost like an augmented chamber group more than a pared down symphony. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very small orchestra, which means that it is more chamber music-like as you're playing with your colleagues rather than being this big, bombastic, huge wall of sound. Um, And so the tone that you need to get is not as fat. You know, you don't need to push the edge to project over them like you do with Brahms. And so Hmm. by lightening up... Up, the danger is that you lighten up the feeling of the music and make it just kind of cute and that's about it you know cute mm-hmm. and nice and and precious almost you know so to retain the intensity without the weight is the challenge and in Mozart's day they would have been playing on gut strings not our modern um, metal strings they mm. also would have been using a, a different a more bouncy kind of a bow and so I've actually had the opportunity to play Mozart's music with that equipment. I do use a normal modern violin on my new CD, but because I've had the experience with the gut strings, I'm able to have a concept of sound that I can then find in the metal strings. And mm-hmm. that, that's been really helpful. I have one more very important question for you before you go, which is what is up with the K's in Mozart titles? Oh, well, I guess it's like the the K in your radio station call letters. What does that mean? I don't know what that means. <laughs> I have no idea. But I do know what the Mozart <laughs> K means. It stands for Kerschel, and he happened to be the guy that cataloged all of Mozart's music. So it's instead of saying opus this or that, um, we've credited Mr. Kerschel, and however he numbered Mozart's works in his catalog are the numbers that we give them, and it's just just an identifier. Huh. Because saying concerto number three doesn't give you as much information as also giving the catalog number, which is presumably somewhat chronological and tells you contextually what other works he wrote you know, at around the same time or earlier or later and just puts it all into perspective in the big picture. Nice. So he was, he was like a Mozart archivist. 
Exactly. Anyway. And actually, speaking of Mozart specialists, I have to give a shout out to my collaborators on this disc because it's really an amazing um, just honor to have performed with or to have recorded with you know these performances on the CD. Sir Neville Mariner and the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. Sir Neville Mariner is one of the most renowned interpreters of Mozart's music ever. And, you know, actually, Neville Mariner and the orchestra that he works with, um, they were the guys that played Mozart's music on the soundtrack for the film Amadeus, which is the great movie oh, about wow. Mozart's life. Oh, it's, yeah. by the way, not very factually accurate. But as it's far an as, awesome movie. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's it's true in the broader sense of the word. It captures yeah. Mozart's personality, even if the details aren't exactly right. So it's it's really a great thing to be inspired and, and understand who Mozart was and what his music was about. And, and the music heard on that film was by these guys that I just recorded Mozart with. So that's like a total dream come true. That's so and cool. Sir Neville Mariner was 89 at the time of our sessions and had so much energy and so many great ideas. And it was a true inspiration working with him. And he wasn't pretentious at all, despite being such a famous guy. <laughs> and there's also a young collaborator on this project for Mozart's double concerto for violin and viola called the Symphonia Concertante, where there are two soloists playing with the orchestra, violin and viola. The violist mm-hmm. that I chose to work with me is um, a 22-year-old young man named Matthew Littman, who's actually someone that I've um, been a bit of a mentor to um, through his life in recent years. Um, He's a recipient of my charitable foundation, the REB Foundation, which supports young artists. So this is his recording debut, so I'm really excited to help introduce him to the world. So it's kind of, you know, these three generations coming together through Mozart and, you know, really a perfect blend. That's very... Very cool. Yeah, I saw a little bit about him in the in the liner notes to the CD, and in the they have a video up about the CD on their website too. Yeah, on YouTube. Really cool. Um, so, are you going to be coming to Houston anytime this year? Because I'd love to see you perform. Actually, I am not coming to Houston this year, Dang. but I hope to be back before too long. Okay. Well, let us know when you're coming. Of and course. We will totally go to the show and hopefully yeah because we have to meet in person i know right (laughs) (laughs) well rachel barton pine thank you so much for taking time out of your busy busy schedule to be in the classical classroom again it's been awesome well thanks so much for having me all right everyone that about does it for this episode of classical classroom for more classroom go to houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom where you can find oodles of links to ways to listen to us, uh, including Stitcher and TuneIn and social media links. Uh, Remember to rate and review us if you're feeling the love. You can always email me at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. I love cute cat pictures, just FYI. Um, Thanks today to audio producer Todd Mr. Titters Hulsander for making us sound nice. Um, Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for just being him. Thanks to Rachel Barton Pine for being on the show today and for always rocking hard and steady. By the way, if you'd like to hear other Classical Classroom episodes with Rachel, we'll put links to those in the article for this show on our website, um, which is, again, houstonpublicmedia.org backslash classroom. Uh, Thanks to Zoe Miller for her consultation on this episode. Thanks to me for saying words. But most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time.